Hello and welcome again to another episode of the Cover Vet Chat. In fact, an episode I was looking very, very much forward to. It's not very often that you meet someone in your life which is just someone you will probably never forget. This person I'm talking to tonight is Noren Chai. He is the head veterinary and the deputy director of the National History Museum of France, the zoological collection um, in Paris. Uh, but he is much more than that. He is not only a dedicated veterinary surgeon, he is a researcher. He is an author of several books. He is somebody who is a um, committed Buddhist, who also, uh, for whom the uh, religion, I think, plays a large role also in the way he approaches his work. He plays the piano. He is somebody everybody falls in love with, men or women, <laughs> once they meet him. And as I said, you will probably not forget this person. So welcome to the Kava Vet Chat, Noreen Chai. Hello. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much. This very nice introduction. Well, uh, no, 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 but that comes that comes from the heart. I, I, I was lucky enough to meet you some years ago at the Eastern European Regional Veterinary Conference in Bucharest, and uh, uh, we had such a good time. And and uh, then I started following you on on Instagram, and I thought, wow, wow, that's. That's very interesting. And, and, and I thought, well, it's not only, I mean, I have a very interesting job. We always, the, we veterinary surgeons, we always look up to the zoo vets because we think, okay, they do just all the fun stuff all the time. It probably won't be like that. You, you, you might educate me a little bit about that, but nevertheless, it's always very interesting sort of suddenly giving an anesthesia to, to, I don't know, a leopard or a tiger or something like that, or uh, dealing with elephants or with snakes or something like that. But then, sort of there is on your Instagram, on your uh, uh, social media uh, uh, outlet, there's just so much more. You, you, you have a good hand for what, what I would call, I don't know, very mindful, good living, not, not extravagant, but, but taking sort of uh, uh, attention to the world around you and also finding the beauty in little things. And that is something I find these days, sort of, we maybe it 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 it, it is doesn't come. Uh, it, it's sometimes looked at not often enough at something like this. So veterinary medicine was it always absolutely clear that you wanted to do veterinary medicine since you were little, or tell us a little bit about how it all came about what, that how you became it all a vet. came about. You know, um, you might know that I have um, I live in France, of course, but. My parents and all my origins come from Cambodia. Mm. And when I was born, there was the, um, the war, the Holocaust. And when you are a child at three years old, you see all these people around you suffering. And mm. since I remember how, I don't know how long, but I have one goal. I said, I have only one goal. I just want to, to heal the world, even when I was mm. a child. And um, I, re I realized that healing the world, it's, it's too much for a child. And, mm. and this child that were in Cambodia was very close to animals. And there was a con connection. I really, I know now I have no, uh, no shame to say that I understand them. I'm very close mm. to animals. You know, uh, when you are young, you're... You, you, you say, I can't say that because maybe they think now at my age, we just don't care. And just, I can tell that I really close to animals. I, I can feel them. I, I can understand them really. And this, uh, I had this since, since I was a child. And I said, why not, not healing the world, but healing, starting by healing with animals first. Mm -hmm. So that came and I, I, 
knew that there was a, a job called veterinarian <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> animals and i said mm-hmm. oh that's mine i'm i want to do this and that was no doubt i it was no i can't imagine doing something else as a veterinarian so yes um it's not like for me veterinarian it's not a job it's a like a pathway like yeah. a, a spiritual pathway now i mm-hmm. realize um, I realize that I'm still not the vet, <laughs> even mm-hmm. if I'm mm-hmm. diplomat or whatever you want. Yeah, I was just about to say, I, uh, <laughs> whoever is listening to this, <laughs> Nori is a diplomat of the European College of <laughs> Veterinary Zoology. He's uh, a qualified at Alpha uh, uh, Veterinary School in France. Uh, he has published, I don't know, 66 or, or, or more publication on all sorts of subjects. So and interesting, you say, still don't feel like a real vet. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. For me, vets, yeah. it's, um, I understand now, vets, for me, it's like um, healing people and animals. We can't separate all. We're just yeah. one world. And, and, um, and before that, if you want really to heal animals, and on, not only animals, but uh, the world around you, the first thing to do that, are still learning is mm. to heal ourselves yeah to understand ourselves and yeah. to accept ourselves and um so you introduced me very very nicely and mm. yes i've been working 23 years now in the national museum mm. and before that i was uh, the head of a national park in africa as well mm. but mm. this i say this is that since three months now i left everything you didn't know that oh. Okay, no, I didn't. I didn't. I, I quit my job, in fact, my, my okay. dream job. Because... because I was, yeah, because I, one of the things I wanted to ask you also is sort of how the, how the zoo has coped with COVID and how you're getting on. But so interesting. So, yeah, so there's some news for me. So, sorry, yeah. tell, tell us more about this. Yes, yeah, you know, as, I, as you told just before, I've been doing surgery, anesthesia, mm-hmm. whatever you think of, whatever mm-hmm. species you think of, I have mm-hmm. done it. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> really, yeah. from, from the wellington, frogs, uh, elephant, rhinos, mm-hmm. I have done this for 20 years. And um, I realized that I just like to break point, you know, mm-hmm. that I... My path is I can do this like this, you know, publishing, yeah. editing some books, go to TV shows, conference, mm. and mm. that's not what I at my at my stage of path of spirituality. Yeah. I think that I I can do more than this. Mm. Uh, I can I think I can uh, touch more people, help more people uh, mm. with the animals. Animals helps me to to mm. grow up. And I think yeah. that now that I grown up with them, they learn, they teach me so much about spirituality, wisdom, mindfulness, um, humility. Animals teach me a lot about humility. When I was young, you know, I was just thinking about publishing, being the best of my field. Uh, mm. And when I see an animal, I saw, I saw, oh, this is a good case, clinical case. Oh, this mm. is a good lecture. Take picture for, for the lecture or for, for publication. And, and one day, one day, um, it was 10 years ago, I make a surgery on orangutans, which animal I was very close to. Yeah. And the surgery was perfect. It's, I mean, it was nice. It was uh, on, with endoscopy and so on. And uh, after the surgery, uh, we saw that the intubation was inflated and all the all the discretion goes into the lungs. There's a false regurgitation. And uh, after a few months, uh, my animal died. Mm. And then I asked myself uh, at this point, uh, you know, you are at the age, at the top of your career, you have done everything. And at the age you say, okay, what's the point to be a vet? it's not like this. And this time, at this time, I just forgot what this little child in Cambodia um, thought, what this little child wanted to do, heal the world, heal the animal, um, 
make the suffering less to everyone. And I forgot this. And this, um, this remind me that, in fact, I'm not a vet. I'm just, I'm not what I was thinking of being a vet. And mm. after 10 years, after these 10 years, uh, I started to, to grow again, thanks to the animals. And this last year then, in September, <laughs> uh, mm. I finally decided to quit this, this job because I was thinking that I can't go further. I, can, mm. I mean, I can do like this yeah. in my life, but I know that in my heart, I'm not growing anymore. Mm -hmm. And I'm mm -hmm. not yeah. growing to be a vet anymore. I yeah. want to be a vet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I, I, I can very much relate to that. I mean, I was... I, I run my own clinic for over 20 years in the UK and uh, I, I, I still very much sort of like the clinical work of veterinary medicine, but I realized, I mean, there is, there is just so much more to, uh, to life. And I mean, we've, <laughs> we might disagree on that, but I would say sort of, we have only one life. You might say, oh, no, no, I'm not so sure on that one as a Buddhist. Okay. But nevertheless, I, I think we should all try to make the most out of that that we have. And um, that also for me meant that although I really like very much sort of my clinic and I have a lovely team, um, there's just so much more out there. And uh, uh, um, about one and a half years ago, um, I stepped away from my own clinic and really dropped it also from one way to the next, then went on some, some, uh, 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 or some conferences and then and, and went abroad for a little while. And then I started working internationally as a veterinarian, both still in the UK, and, but also in Scandinavia and also in Germany. And because... I saw there is just so much more out there. And I'm, I, I, I met veterinary teams in all of these different countries. And I mean, if there wouldn't have been COVID, uh, it would not have been only these three countries. It would have been much more. I would have gone much further uh, because let's face it. I mean, as veterinarians, we have a, such a wonderful job. We have a great, great opportunities. We are not going home after having worked a whole day producing Kalashnikovs or something like that. We have done something we can, if we do, if, 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 if we work in the right field or take the right approach to it, it is something we can have a good feeling about it. Or, and, and as you said, I mean, it's not necessarily just so that you, that you have treated successfully an animal you have often done a far bigger job because connected to the animal is a person, is a family. And it might be children that are very fond of the dog or the cat you have treated, it might be an older person where the, uh, the animal is the only link to, to, uh, to a partner who has passed away or who is for this person the, the only meaning of getting up or the only reason for getting up in the morning. And uh, sometimes it's, it's just nice that, that being able to do something. I'm not saying to do, uh, 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 that, that, that we change a lot, but at least being able to make a little bit of a difference, not only to the animal, but also to, to, to the people connected to it. Mm -hmm. Exactly, it is exactly yeah. this. Mm -hmm. And it, yes, I'm a still a vet, you know, I just quit my job, but I'm doing also surgery still. Yeah. <laughs> like a referral a consultant yeah. in, a, in wildlife mm. and exotics. But uh, as you said, there is a connection in everything. Um, animals like dogs and cats, they are the world for some people. They are their lives. And when mm. you save this life, you save a yeah. kind of world. And it's very nice that uh, we as vet, we have this so so wonder, wonderful opportunities to help people mm. and to help yeah. animals. And in fact, to help a kind of little world. And it's so nice, really. Mm. Um, I, saw, I cheer so much all my colleagues vets when they really are in this kind of mood, you know, when mm. they don't forget 
why they have been vets, why they have done so much studies to be vets. And, mm. and I share so much all these uh, passionate colleagues and that, that uh, all these passionate colleagues like you, like, like mm. many colleagues, are, mm. there are some lights in our, in our eyes. And well, but that is, you see, that is, that is very, very important that that continues to be the case. I mean, I, I have a lot of vets who I went to vet school together with um, who are disillusioned, who are depressed, who left the job not uh, with such a positive attitude as you did, but who left the job because they are completely disappointed with, with their choice. And... Uh, well, I mean, but then if you have sometimes a look at exactly that, what you said, how they conduct their own life, exactly. it doesn't come as a surprise. Because if the whole day is stress and you are not happy with yourself, you get yourself up in the morning, you look in the mirror and you're already not happy with that, what you see. <laughs> and, and, and then you, 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 you go to work you, you, you arrive and there's a team and everybody is not happy. <laughs> so the whole day is not only an uphill struggle, it's also so that, and that's my personal opinion, I don't think that you will deliver a good job. You will do not do a good job. We recently um, looked very much into the issue of collegiality at FICAVA and WSAVA. We have this, uh, we have our joint Congress uh, uh, in, a, uh, in a month's time. And uh, for that, we are, uh, we're producing um, a special document that is highlighting the importance of communication, respect, but also, as I said, good collegiality that you look out for your fellow human beings. And by doing that, you will feel better. And also, I think you will do a better job as a veterinarian. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. What you mentioned about sort of the, uh, uh, what you learn from your patients. Uh, I saw uh, you uh, uh, published one book, um, Sagesse Animal. Is that, uh, sorry about my pronunciation, unfortunately. Okay. French. Okay. No, <laughs> I had Latin at school, but um, so translated, uh, I don't know if it is the right translation, animal wisdom. Exactly. Is, is looking basically us exactly. into this, you know? Yes, it's uh, called Animal Wisdom. It's, uh, mm. This book was written for, to make people understand that um, it's, uh, through animals that we can reach our humanity mm. um, because when you are connected with animals you are connected with nature with all, everything around you and, mm. and in fact you remember you realize that you are part of this nature so mm. with animals you reconnect finally to yourself and, and to yourself it's humanity so I think that when you, we animals, all kind of animal um, can remind us our part that's humanity. We we don't want to to see sometimes like violence, like um, like real real uh, aggressiveness, and also uh, altruism, uh, wisdom, uh, serenity, mindfulness. All these things is part of the human being, as as we are. We are in fact, it's. I, I just say that we are just like a um, light body, you know, spiritual angels, everyone, you, me, everyone, Andrea. <laughs> and we just put with uh, beliefs, with social pressure, with all this, all this uh, uh, have to, have to, uh, what they think of. And we put some shields around us and we don't let our light just get through us. And animals tell us, hey, you are like me. You are a spiritual body. You are not only a mental body. You can do so much thing. On, 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 your, on your little world, you can do so much thing. And animals tell me this. And animals tell me this also, that you have to take care of yourself. And if you are violent, it's okay too. 
if you are sad, it's, it's, it's okay to not to be okay as well. And it's a path that uh, they lead us to, to our humanity. That's the, that's the book. I thought, I mean, we have seen over the last yeah, 10, 12 months now with the ongoing pandemic, there is a huge increase in dog and cat ownership. So far more people decide now to have a pet again because I think they realize, I mean, they can have as many gadgets as they like at home. There is just no replacement for the interaction with, with nature and also, as I said, with animals. And they also realize what a stabilizing factor for family or for just individuals life, dog or, or, or a cat can be. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I mean, and, 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 and that is always, I mean, this is a, this is a gift that comes without any demand. Mm -hmm. So the dog is just happy to be with you and just happy. come home and uh, uh, somehow, I don't know, we might have some, we might have a partner who has had a miserable day and you come through the door and the partner is also not very happy. <laughs> that doesn't happen with a dog or, or even, even with a cat. I mean, the cats, the cats are a little bit different. They are, they are more subtle. They are more subtle. They are more independent. So a cat might in general be, a little bit more independent and might not necessarily sort of come closer or they are all over you all the time so but then that's there's there's some sort of normality and as i said there's also this sort of i they, you can feel that uh you just feel better if you if you stroke a dog if you stroke a cat if you just have an animal around you i mean it's sort of, I thought sort of if I'm if I'm really ill or so I wouldn't mind a purring cat sort of at the end of my bed or something like that. It just gives you just so much peace and uh, and just makes you relax. And I mean also if I sort of for for this vet chat here, I sort of I have a nice sort of comfortable uh, sort of crash area here in the flat. I'm recording this one so. When I talk to Nori, I I want to have a chilled, relaxed environment, sort of, and I wouldn't mind if here we would have a, a cat sitting, purring away, or so that would chill me even more. <laughs> so, yeah, but what is it? What is it that animals have this effect on us? Mm -hmm. Because they so, don't I mean, there is, it, it must have to do with the fact that there is a link between living creatures. And I mean, not only talking sort of animals, it might even include, fly, uh, inc uh, 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 include plants around us. There is, there is just something different. Theoretically, we are just water and a little bit of carbon and something <laughs> like that, that theoretically would just be soil or something like that and water. And yet, we are alive, a cat is alive, a dog is alive, and there is somehow a bond between all these creatures. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's interesting that, that, that you see it possibly more so than, than I do, working, having worked for, for a long time with zoo animals. I mean, I'm working, or I've been working mainly with dogs and cats, and I know how close the bond with a dog or a cat is. But I mean, you worked with amphibes, you worked with snakes, yeah. you worked with a lot of wild animals who probably would be most happy if there would not be a human around, but they would be sort of away from us so, so obviously if you have a cat that sort of sits next to you in purse and so then yeah okay you can understand that but if you have animals that don't interact with humans yet feeling still there is a link and an important link between us it's it's a very interesting take mm -hmm. yeah exactly and most of us um most of us if you work with wildlife in in as you say in situ conservation you know I also yeah. travel to make surgery in many countries. <laughs> yeah. And, 
And um, it's different, of course, uh, from the zoos and even from clinics and dogs and cats, I imagine. But um, it's more because you are in front of something that is completely, at the first step, very, very strange to you. But the further you go step by step near this wild animal, you realize that it's just a part of you as well. Mm. more and more and more because he has his own world living and you enter it, this world but you realize you are already in this world with him and, mm. um, yes it's, um, it's a link we have everyone and uh, as you mentioned also in your introduction I do a lot uh, some application of this kind of um, uh, spiritual view in my own job uh, mm. I can't I can't, uh, I can't um, cure a snake if I don't think of his hygrometry, temperature, and so on, so on, so on. As I can't uh, work with orangutans or chimpanzees if I don't uh, think of their psychology, if I don't think about their history, about their link with other animals, or the link with the rangers or the keepers. Mm. So everything is linked. Everything mm. is linked and, and uh, has to be... Um, when you are a zoo vet, you know that everything is linked more than more than um, more than a dog and cat because some some vets do not make the link between the owner and the cat. You know, you have cystitis in, in cats, for instance. Cystitis mm. in cats, it's more emotional. And mm. um, when when I have some friends or people ask me for treating a, a cat with cystitis, I just ask, "And you, what about you? Mm. How do you feel?" Mm -hmm. And always, mm -hmm. always, the guy said, oh, you know, I'm just, I don't know. I'm, I'm stressed. <laughs> stressed so I had a bad oh. time lately. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's so funny that um, there's always a link with everyone. And when a dog comes in your clinic, the vet should ask the owner, and what about you? What mm -hmm. is your history? How, how are you feeling? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. most of the time you see the link. And it's funny because you can treat the, the dog or the cat and because I do some clinics too, now I return for my, to have a, a, a little view of the clinics as well. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and, uh, and all now, all the time I, I talk to the, to the owners and they're just not surprised that said, oh, this, this vet is different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We are well, but, but, but that's, that's the thing. I had just so many appointments where in fact, I didn't do any treatment at all. I just reassured the owner. We had a chat about what was going on and why they were worried, why they thought some something is not right with their dog or their cat. And I, I checked the animal over, but it was not a clinical problem. It was something that was absolutely fine. It was just a lot of anxiety on, on the side of the owner. And uh, they projected that on to their pets or they were just very anxious about nothing and they just needed to talk to somebody about it. But they were generally also quite, what shall I say, insecure or um, uh, not sure what was going on and, and, and sometimes really needed their reassurance. Mm. Exactly. And they were suffering yeah. most of the time as well. Yeah. How, as a, uh, as a um, Buddhist, how, and as a veterinary surgeon, how did you approach the issue of euthanasias? How oh. did that work? Euthanasias, having oh. to put animals down, because obviously I can see that there must be a conflict, but then if you see that an, a, a, a patient is really suffering, I mean, I personally, I never had a problem with it if I was comfortable with the reason why the animal had to be put to sleep because I thought okay I have here the tool on hand to stop the suffering and I cannot see as a professional I cannot see a way out of this for this animal this animal will not get better so so that that then reassured me but it had to come with always the possibility that I also had to say no. If I felt it's not right, if somebody came and said, here, I had enough of this dog, so uh, uh, can you please put, it, uh, put him down? Or, or so, no, no. <laughs> if, I, if I, as a veterinary surgeon, 
didn't feel 100% okay with it, then I was the wrong person for this job. And, and, and I denied it, but, but I was very comfortable with it. But how did that, I mean, you must have had situations yeah, with zoo course, animals where you thought. Of course. And you have the, the key word is this, just one key word is suffering. Mm. You the the point is as I told you as my point of view as a vet is not treating illness or disease is treating suffering. It's completely different. We're not mm. treating. I'm not treating um, a disease, and I want to treat suffering. So mm. if there's no way out for the animal, a zoo or domestic or whatever, and mm. there's only just one way to make him suffer less or just stop his suffering of course i'm doing i do this it's um, mm. um and i'm really comfortable with this because i feel that i'm on my on the right place on the right time for this animal and mm. exactly uh um when we have to do some other euthanasia euthanasia it's a medical act it's not it's not it's different from a managing population um we did some of this to to be honest we also do this um, in zoo population as well. Yeah. Yeah. So you can ask me, how can I deal with this? And I just say that if I don't do this, because I have a, a problem with my population management, this animal will be isolated. Mm. And uh, he will be suffering by cutting social interaction. So he will die slowly or have other disease because he was stressed. He would be stressed. So the best way in this situation is euthanasia or is cunning, um, just putting down to, to make the, the group better and mm. to, to have a better um, healing or um, harmony in the group. So mm. I think that, um, yes, and in this time also, I'm, I quite, I'm quite comfortable as well because if I don't do this, the animal will be suffering more. So, um, yes, I think that um, everything that I, that I do, and that I, think that, I think that you do as well, is to, to see, to evaluate if we are okay with ourselves, with our value, and we can, if we are in the right place and the right time, yes. Yeah. And, and this question I ask myself all the time right now. <laughs> mm. yeah. <laughs> So what are, what, are your, what are your plans from here on, sort of as you are sort of approaching sort of new pastures, sort of uh, you're still working partially clinical, yes. but uh, what else are you planning to do? I mean, I would assume that COVID has affected you also quite considerably with your plans. I mean, yes. at least with my plans, sort of it has of affected me considerably. I try to make the most out of it, but but still, sort of. I mean, how how is that with you? Oh, so yes, I do some clinic as well. I do some uh, uh, clinical part of wildlife a little bit with private yeah. owners yeah. and some uh, zoo private zoos and um, mm. and some exotics. But also, mostly, I've uh, built a hospital in Indonesia in Sumatra. Okay. Uh, mm. <laughs> Where, where, where in Indonesia did you say? North, North, North Sumatra. Sumatra. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, the COVID has just uh, stopped my plans. I, normally, I'm, I have built like an internship, wildlife internship with this, with Sumatra and with my hospital and friends and every, every vet that wants to do wildlife. But this plan is stopped right now. I mean, it's on standby. And I'm doing lectures. And you know, it's just a few months that I quit my dream job. So, so I don't know right now what I'm, I'm just like a no man's land. I just try to find my way <laughs> as well. Yes. Yeah, well, 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 but I, <laughs> it's the SAS, uh, 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 well, it's, it's a motto of the SAS actually, but who dares wins. Mm, so, and, and I think, yeah, there is something to it. It takes some guts. Especially, I mean, if I've, I think uh, a lot of young vets would give their left arm to get the job sort of you have had. And then to say, well, okay, I've done this now. I could do this for 
another 20 years, 30 years or something like that. But no, there's, there's more to life. I, I did a lot, I learned a lot, but I want to do just other things. And so interesting, so, so uh, building a hospital in Sumatra. Why, why not in Cambodia? Was, uh, uh, was Indonesia, uh, did you have links to Indonesia uh, yes, for, for this uh, work? Yes, it was the local government asked me to, to build this hospital. And mm. Cambodia had more projects, it's more humanitarian project. So mm. not, not, not to do with, with, with vets, it's more with children and, and human in Cambodia. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Wow, yeah, that's, that's so exciting. So I definitely will, will, will follow this. Uh, so um, I saw the, the, your two books, um, uh, Sagesse Animal. Uh, has that been translated into English no, yet? No, not yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, if anybody is out there who hears this, so if that might be an interesting thing. You wrote another book, Harmonies, I yes. think. <laughs> yes. So that uh, um, that's something else. So at least sort of if you speak French, you know, that's something to to look out for. So it's always entertaining speaking to you, Noreen. I have to say thank you so much for speaking to me in this episode of Fekava Vet Chat. Um, if anyone who has seen this or heard this on our podcast uh, would like to comment or would like to get in touch, you can do so by emailing us on vetchat at fekava.org or you can contact us through our social media presence or on our website, which is fikava.org. Thank you very much for joining us and welcome again to another episode of Fikava Bad Chat next week.